So if we want to record a screencast, there are two streams again. This, the stream of audio, usually from your microphone input, and the stream of video from your screen. Okay, that is your monitor. For recording the audio, I'll use a program called SOX, S-O-X. And the actual command is called REC for record. And we can use FFmpeg to do the same thing, but let's just use something different. And I'll just go straight to the command for recording audio. It will not be very successful on your computers if you have no audio input, but we'll give you the command anyway. REC for record, it tells SOX to record from the microphone. You specify the sampling rate. With recording audio, we take the analog input and sample it and convert those samples into binary. So what rate do we sample? 44 kilohertz or 44,100 hertz is a common rate. That's what that's specifying. And every sample becomes 16 bits, minus B16. And with how many channels do we want? Stereo is two channels, mono is one, most microphones are mono, so one should be enough. Of course, there are more than two channels with uh, different audio systems. And save as a file. And FLAC is a format for lossless audio. It loses no quality, so it's probably the best in terms of the original recording of audio. You can later convert it to other more convenient files if, if you need. And run the command. Will it work on this computer? It's running, but it's running on computer 4. Not very useful. At uh, 24. See if I can run it on my laptop. And it, it's recording. Note that, so now on this screen, which is not what you see on your marks, but this is, so this is computer 24 back in the corner. There's no audio. This is my laptop. There is audio in because it's coming from the sound system and you see as I talk some very basic feedback of the audio strengths going up and down. So it's recording some audio, fine. And we can stop that. Control C will stop the recording. And we'll see that my audio.flac file is 1.7 megabytes. Okay, so that was the recording of audio. Easy. We can record audio. Uh, just to check, we can look at the audio. Audacity just opens up this file in a uh, audio editor. So there it is, okay, so uh, a waveform representation of that 30 seconds or so of audio that I recorded. Of course, you need an audio input to record that, so a microphone, for example. If anyone's really interested, there's one microphone here. I'm sure you'll find not so interesting. Now the screen. So recording audio is relatively easy. Now we want to record the screen. Who exited on mine? Okay, I'll, I'll stay for now on my laptop because uh, just one minute, someone has a question for me. She's going to give us money for lunch, so I better answer. Today is the last day. Okay, that's your Thank you. Done. Let's try and record the screen to
what I'm doing now is on the laptop, so you cannot follow it on your, on your screen. You have to look at the actual screen. I'll zoom in a little bit more. We can use FFmpeg as well as other programs to record the screen. Let's show you with FFmpeg. We want to record from a special device. Okay? Normally with FFmpeg we can specify where do we get the video from. Well, we use the minus F option and it's called X11 grab because in, in Unix or Linux the, the display is run by software called X11. So what this tells FFmpeg to do is to grab everything on my display, on my screen. But we should specify some other things. How fast should we grab my screen? So I can specify a rate. Video is done in frames per second. How many frames per second do I want to record? Well, I can set whatever I prefer. 10, for example. Every second, FFmpeg will take really a screenshot of my computer. Take 10 screenshots of my computer every second. And that will be combined to be a video. I can specify the size. And usually, if I remember, the resolution of my monitor. So that may change on different computers. So the size, if I want to capture the entire screen, the resolution of the monitor. Uh, with a display, this one will make more sense in a moment, minus i is just some notation for... With monitors you may have multiple displays. And in fact I do have multiple displays set up, my laptop plus the projector. But uh, we can deal with that later. These are just the defaults. We'll see them change in a moment. So this is saying record my screen at a rate of 10 pictures per second, 10 frames per second, because video is just pictures uh, at a changing rate, a changing, and of some size, some resolution. And now I want to use a video codec to encode it, create an output. And a common and quite good in terms of performance codec is H264, and the implementation on Linux is using library x264, lib x264. That codec has some options, and these I don't always remember, but I'll just copy. When we are recording the screen, we want to do it quickly. We don't want my CPU to slow down trying to create the video. So we set some options to be ultra-fast. That is, maybe lower quality, but it'll be fast in encoding. and some other quality indicator, CRF0 I think it was. Something else. Uh, again, this is on the website, so I better go have a look to remind myself. It's this command. And I think then we're done and then the file that we want to create, mp4. Record from the display at a rate of 10 frames per second at the resolution specified. Does it work? The minus i 0, .0 .0 refers to the display, so the, the window, or the, the operating system, you can refer to different displays. Like, you can have multiple monitors. Okay. You have only one, so I think you can even omit this parameter. But this is the default. But I'll change it in a moment, because when you have two, you can specify the offset. This 0, 0 specifies the offset from the top left corner of your screen of where you want to record. If you don't want to record your whole display, you can reduce the size and add an offset here so that, for example, you record just this portion of the display. And that's what we'll use it for in the moment. Let's see if it works. It's recording. How do you know? 
is recording my laptop screen. And to stop, control C, and I'll open it and just see if it did actually record. Uh, it's come up on my... This is the recording of my laptop screen. I shifted around. You didn't see it because I have two monitors set up. It's what's actually on my laptop screen, not on the projector that was recorded. So now let's do a slight variation and I want to record with my setup I've got two monitors laptop plus projector and the setup that they're side by side okay, laptop and then next to that is the monitor is the projector I want to record just the projector from the output of my graphics card just the projector so I can modify that to specify set the size to be the resolution of the projector and set an offset to be the size the horizontal width of my laptop screen it's a bit confusing but imagine and there's a picture on the website here's my laptop screen here's the uh, here's the projector so with respect to this software it's one big display so I want to record a resolution of 1024 by 768 and an offset from the top left of 1366 so the top left is here go across 1366 and then record at the resolution specified. That is, record this part of the display. So it just records what's projected, not what's shown on my laptop. I overwrite, yes. And I move around. And you should see when we stop the recording what we're rec you're seeing right now. That worked. Now I'll open that. Okay, so this recording is what was shown only on the projector, not what's shown on my laptop screen, because the display is extended, it's not mirrored in this case. So the last step, so we can record audio, easy. We can record the screen now, easy. We want to record both of them at the same time. How do you do that? Just start them at the same time. Start the recording of the audio and the video at the same time. And then after that you can combine them to get a, a video of your, your format of you, your desire. Uh, but I think with time being a bit after three, how do you combine them? That'll be a task for you to do when you go home this weekend. Okay. You'll see on the website the command for recording the screen. Then the extension if you've got multiple monitors. If you want to record, say I have a laptop and projector, if you want to record just the projected image, not your laptop as well, then you can follow the command to do, do that. Of course, if you mirror the display, same on laptop as projector, this is not an issue. If you don't mirror them, like I'm doing in this lecture, then you need to specify some offset as to what you want to record. Then the next step is do them at the same time. And the way I do it is just put them in a script and run that at script. Record the audio, record the screen, and a little bit of other mess here such that they will stop when I stop the script. Okay. So you start the script, the script starts recording your audio, starts recording your screen, and in this case when you press Z it will stop recording both of them 
and exit the script. You may download that script and the, the, the extended one and try it. Uh, you can either do it on these computers, you can download it. I think it's downloaded in the ITS332 directory. Uh, you may try uh, screencast is the name of the script, NetLab tests. It may work on your computers right now. The last step, once you have both a audio stream and video stream, you combine them using FFmpeg to create a, a video that contains both of them. And the last few commands show you how to do that. But I think you can work that out on yourself. Okay, first thing. On the command line, let's download a file. Wget is a program to get a web page. Web page get. And we pass as a parameter a URL. You need to know the URL. Well, I know some. And, well, do I? Maybe I'll just copy and paste from the web browser. So I don't make a mistake. W get some URL, a HTML file, in this case a PDF file. All it will do is download that file and save it on my hard disk. I hope. Yep. Take some time to get started. Print, print some status information and says, all right, 100% complete. I downloaded the Bitcoin lecture slides from one of our earlier workshops. And if we do an ls, we should see bitcoin.pdf there. So very simple, download a particular file from a website with wget. Useful if you want to include it inside scripts. Maybe your script relies on some web page or some, some program on a web server. You can download it automatically in the script. Useful for other things who are automatically downloading many web pages. You, I will not do it, I don't have the exact syntax, but there are many options for wget which will allow it to download a HTML file, automatically look for all the links inside that file and download those links and then download those links and so on. So it can act like a spider and download many web pages automatically. We may see an example towards the end. Let's download another one while we're here. Which one? Uh, internet privacy. So we have two, two PDFs. I've got two PDFs. Let's do something with those PDFs. Let's combine them. PDFTK is a program that does, well, I'd say basic manipulation of PDF files. Combining, splitting, uh, a few other operations. PDFTK, the two files, it's going to wrap around. And then take those two files and concatenate them. So the operator is cat. And output a new file. PDFTK, the two files that we want to combine, concatenate. And then we tell PDFTK to cat. Cat is short for concatenate. Concatenate the two files and output to some new file, new.pdf. It should just return to the prompt, no output if there are no errors. Now open the new file. I will not do it here, but you can do it from your desktop. Or to, to start the PDF viewer, evince. Evince new.pdf. Evince is the, the Linux or the, the PDF viewer on 
our operating system. Instead of Acrobat Reader, we have Evince. Press enter. I will not press enter because I'm logged into another computer. It won't work. But you can. Evince, new.pdf, it should open up your PDF reader and it should contain the lecture slides for both of those topics. One concatenated after the other. Evince. Evince is a PDF reader. So you may have Acrobat Reader, you have what else? Foxit Reader. Evince is another one. Okay. I'll let you look at this PDF, I will not. Just a couple of other examples with PDF TK before we move away from that. Uh, the man page for PDF-DK is quite short, but, but very good. But let's give a couple. A equals, we can use some labels for files. A is our internet privacy options PDF. B is our Bitcoin PDF. So we don't have to refer to their full names, I can refer to A and B. Concatenate the two. Take the first page of file A, A1, the first to the second page of A, file A, A1 to 2, rotate them. Which direction? West. Okay, 90 degrees to the west. That's what W means. Rotate 90 degrees to the west and take this is just an example, it's not very useful. The first two pages of file B, rotate them to the east, and output uh, some other PDF. So here, just illustrating that we can select the individual pages from those input PDFs. We can use shortcuts, say A equals this input PDF, B equals bitcoin.pdf, Cat means combine the two, but don't combine all of them. For file A, take pages one to two. W means rotate, rotate those pages 90 degrees to the west. To the west, that way, counterclockwise. And for file B, take the first two pages and rotate them 90 degrees to the east. And then output a new file. And then you look in the new file and just check if it did it work? I will not open it. You need a space. PDFTK at the start. Oh. Sorry, let, let me show the command at the top so it's a bit clearer. The PDF toolkit combines and selects pages from that, those two input PDFs. Open it up and just check. Press enter. Press enter. Oh, you're on someone else's screen. Okay, you're, you're right. I'm confused. Good. Why would you want to manipulate PDF files on the command line? Again, if you want to automate things. One example I've used it for is I scan in everyone's exam. Uh, thousands of pages just scans. And then use PDFTK to separate them out per student because every student's exam has the same number of pages. Rotate the pages if you or if you scan the front pages first and then scan the back pages second, then PDFTK can combine them, shuffle them correctly, uh, can do other things that uh, are useful if you have scans, or if you need to automatically process different PDF files. I will not go through any more examples. There's a few more on the website. It can do things like 
If you look at the man page for PDFTK, the man page is quite good. Merge PDF documents, split them, rotate, decrypt if there's a password in some cases, not all cases. Uh, encrypt, fill in PDF forms, again in some cases. Some PDF files are actually forms where you can type stuff into them. Uh, apply a watermark, a background watermark over the top of a PDF and a few other things. Extract some data from those PDF files. Let's move beyond PDF and let's go to video. I know you've all been waiting to watch the video on your desktop. I'm going to delete my PDF files, I don't need them. RM for delete or remove. Be careful when you delete things, that is, again, there's no trash or recycle bin, it's gone. I shouldn't tell you this, but RM has a recursive option, RM minus uppercase R, means delete this and the subdirectories. So rm minus uppercase r star means delete everything in this directory and all its subdirectories and all its subdirectories and so on. Don't do that. Especially start from the top directory, the root, and delete all its subdirectories. That is, delete the entire file system. Don't do that. videos. I've downloaded and I think you all have it on your computer, a, a movie, Tears of Steel. Let's do some processing on this movie and we're going to use software called FFmpeg. FFmpeg uh, is, is a standalone program for processing video and also is, provides libraries which many other programs use. So many websites, if they have some video processing, may use the FFmpeg library. And many uh, other programs that display video may use the FFmpeg libraries. To get the things that we want in our demo, I had to install FFmpeg and compile it from the source code. Okay, so I had to set it up to do the things that we want. So that's a bit of a uh, time-consuming task. It's not too hard. That's why you see this FFmpeg build directory. Eh? It contains the code after the compilation and the bin directory contains the actual executables for FFmpeg. Let's use it to first look at the, the well, why don't you play it? You can use FFmpeg to play video files but normally we use it to process them. There are many media players. One that you have on your computer is VLC, correct? VLC, try it. VLC is just a, is a media player which also uses the FFmpeg libraries. See if the video plays on your computer. You probably don't have audio, okay? No speakers. Did you? If you bring your headphones, you can listen as well. Uh, we will not watch at all. Let me just set up while you're watching. Okay, so you can watch the video. It's a full movie that, well, it's a full short movie. Uh, but let's do some processing on it. 
And in fact, to process videos, you need to know a little bit about what is a video. So that makes things a little bit more confusing. Let's have a look. First thing we'll do is look at some information about that file. Let's use ffpro, which is a part of ffmpeg, but just gives us info about the file. And then the file name, Tears of Steel. ffpro. Press enter and you'll see a whole lot of output. Uh, mine scrolled through. Again, FF Pro, followed by the file name. At the top, you cannot see it on my screen, but at the top it shows some information about the, the version of FFmpeg. Not so useful for us. Then it shows, I think, from here onwards, input. It shows something about the file. And the things that we're going to focus on is, if you go to the bottom, we have two streams. Remember, video or movie is not just video, it's video plus audio. Okay? And they're separate streams. So it says there are two streams inside this file. One is a video stream, stream 0, 0 is a video stream. And it uses a codec which converts the, the video information into binary called H264 and some other color information and the resolution of the video 1280 by 534 24 frames per second and some other information the second stream is audio so the soundtrack using the codec AAC to convert the, the sound into binary at some sampling frequency of 44,000 Hertz using stereo audio, so two channels. So it tells us something about the, the streams inside this file. What's the format of this file? Again, what is the format of this file? MKV. So the format, or sometimes called a container, that's the structure in which we include the streams. So this is MKV, or Matroska is the name. So the extension MKV. That's the format of the file. But inside this file, there are in fact two streams, an audio and a video stream, and they use different codecs. That is, the video codec is H.264 and the audio codec AAC. It's confusing sometimes. that We often need to distinguish between the, the format, usually from the file extension, but not always, but the format, and the codecs used for the streams inside that file okay. right. will come up as, as we go. All right, so we know information about the file. Let's do something with it. How long is the movie? Did it say somewhere? Duration. It's a short movie. 12 minutes, 14 seconds. So we know the duration. Let's Let's split it and just grab maybe 20 seconds from that movie. So we use FFmpeg. We want to start, so the movie starts at time zero. We want to cut part of that movie, let's say starting at time 50. And I just did this yesterday as an example, so we'll repeat it. S-SS. -S Let's go to the top, so if you're looking on the screen, you can see it easier. SS is the start time. Let's get it right. Zero hours, what have I done wrong? Zero hours, zero minutes, 50 seconds. So start 50 seconds into the movie. The input file is our movie file, Tears of Steel. Don't get confused with the other one, which is a stereo audio only file. And duration that we want to take of this file, minus T, is 20 seconds, just so we get a short part of the movie. That is, I want to grab just from time 50 seconds to time 1 minute 10 seconds of the movie and put it into another file. 
Maybe you want to make a clip or something. And we're going to take the input file and videos and audio files use a particular codec to convert that into binary, and to convert the original input into binary, the codec. This one we saw use H.264. We take the input file, which uses H.264, and the output file that we want to create, we want to use the same codec. We don't want to change it. Later we will change. So we'll just copy. So when we specify the video codec, we use the same as the input. So we say V codec copy. And the audio codec, we will not change. We'll copy from the input. So these parameters are telling us how to create the output. And then the name of the output file. Tears of Steel, whatever you want to call the file. TOS. MKV, not MKS. Try, press enter. If I got it all right, this may take a second or so. If, it, if there's an error, it usually prints a color-coded message on this terminal, red or something. So if you don't see red, you're OK. So it, it really just processes the file and cuts for 20 seconds out of that movie, from the 12 minutes down to 20 seconds. So we now have another file. We can probe the new one, FF probe on the, the, the output file. And we see what? The duration is now 20 seconds. Same video codec, same audio codec. You can play it if you like, just to check. You should have just 20 seconds of video. I will not play it on my computer because I'm logged into another one. If you see red, then there's a syntax error. I'll show it again, the command. Just so it's clear. That was the command I used. Dash V codec, dash A codec. MK, MKV, not MPK. <laughs> Unable to find, so check the, the syntax exactly here. Minus V codec, minus V codec. It's very confusing the syntax sometimes in some of these options. Mm. Why? Run, just run FFmpeg by itself. Just FFmpeg. Mm. This computer 29 doesn't have the software, or it doesn't have the latest update. Uh, try this one, or this one. I don't know why, but I, maybe I didn't update that one correctly. Work? Yep. Why? Uh, maybe. Um, ah. Path. Okay, we'll fix it here. Okay, now I think you're fixed. Okay, there was the path was wrong. So it didn't convert anything, it just cut in this case. It's quite fast, less than a second to do that. Conversion may be more time consuming. Who's messing with my terminal? Let's convert. 
very easy to convert. We will convert just the small 20 second clip. Conversion in some cases may be very slow. Okay? You need to decode and encode and that may be slow, especially on these old computers that are three or four years old. We're getting new ones next month. Okay? So do what you like with them today. We're going to get new ones next month. But let's convert. And we'll just do it on the short 20 second clip. Input minus I. And then specify the output. But what do we... So I want to convert my MKV encoded, or my MKV format file, which has H.264 video and AAC audio, I want to convert it into a different format. Well, let's try. What's another format? Anyone? MKV, MP4? Try MP, MP4. So that's it. If this works, we'll see. Take this input file and produce this output file. And in many cases, FFmpeg will check the output extension and determine automatically what format you want, MP4, and what codec to use. Sometimes you must specify the exact codec, but in the most common cases, it works automatic. Should run, it may take a, f a while. Okay. Do it only on the short file. This is on the 20 second clip. Done. A few seconds. If you do it on the 12 minute clip, you, uh, movie, you'll be waiting a long time. Let's probe that file, the output file, just to check what we got. FF probe our tos.mp4. The input, the, the format now is listed as all of these. They're all related, or I think all the same, but it's MP, MPEG-4 format. We did that. The The video stream, H264, so I think it's the same codec. There may be some different parameters, but it was re-encoded. And the audio, AAC. So in fact, it's using the same audio and video codec, but just a different container. And that's common with videos. That is, the video and audio are encoded the same, but the container file, the one that it combines them together is different. MP4 versus MKV. And in fact, converting between them is not too hard in that case. Let's convert a couple of others. Any other containers? Older style videos? AVI? AVI? I've tried WebM. is a web format. Optimized for some web streaming or web pages. WebM, AVI, MP4, MKV are different formats. Some will be faster than others. Some require uh, different algorithms to, re to encode the video, which are faster than others. This one's doing about 10 frames per second. It's quite slow. So really, if you want to convert videos, you need to know something about what containers mean or what formats are, and also the codecs used for video and audio to choose the right one. Have a look at the file sizes.
compare the file sizes and maybe even run ffprobe on each of those just to see the different codecs used. So my MKV, a nice option for LS is LS minus H. H for human friendly. The sizes are human friendly. So normally the sizes are given in bytes. If you include the minus H option, you get them in megabytes, gigabytes, kilobytes, and so on. A little bit easier to read. MKV, 6.6 .6 meg. MP4, 3 meg. AVI, 1.9. WebM, 732K. Different codecs uh, produce different quality video and audio. And as a result, you get different size files. Generally, the smaller the size, the lower the quality. But not always. Some codecs can produce the same quality with smaller sizes. And FFmpeg for, supports many different uh, formats and codecs. Let's compare to the MKV original file used H.264 as the video codec, AAC as the audio codec. The WebM container or format used VP8 as video and Vorbis as audio. So it had to re-encode the audio and video using different codecs, different algorithms. If you want to see the codecs and formats supported by FFmpeg, FFmpeg minus formats will show you all the containers like AVI, MKV, MP4, and all the ones it supports. And there are many. Okay? Some very old, some hardly ever used, but it supports many different formats some you'll recognize. And codecs are the way that the audio and video are encoded and decoded. You can see the list of codecs it supports, including MP3, uh, the, the ones we saw, the VP8, H.264, H.265, and many others. I will not show it, but you can have a look. What about, is that a question? Questions? You may ask. Let's extract the audio from the movie. Extract just the audio stream from that movie. Remember, there are two streams. If we do an FF probe of our original clip, the 20 second clip, video stream using H.264, audio stream using AAC. Maybe we just want the audio for some reason. FFmpeg, input, our MKV file, Video, none or null. So the, the shortcut there is minus VN. We don't want the video as output. Audio output, copy. Okay, so we take, take the movie as input. Two streams. Video stream, we don't want to copy. So minus VN saying null for the video stream. Audio codec, copy from the input. That is, use the same f codec for the audio. And then you specify the output file name. Maybe TOS audio dot, dot what? What extension should we use? MP3. Are we using the MP3 codec? 
what was the input codec? The audio codec was AAC. Okay, MP3 is another codec. AAC uh, is a different one. There are many different audio codecs. It's not MP3. Well, you don't see it very often. What about AAC? Yep, next command we will. So just repeat that command. It happens quite quick. Take the input file. V minus VN, null video, no video. I don't want video. Audio codec, copy, and the output file. The next thing is, okay, what if you do want MP3? Let's repeat that command, but also convert at the same time. So, again, same input, VN, audio codec, MP3. And with MP3, you can have different quality. How do we specify quality in MP3? Sometimes you may have heard of different quality MP3 files. What, what's the measure? Bit rate. So you may have 128 kilobits per second, 256. Let's do a simple one, 64 kilobits per second. Sorry. Minus AB. I'll get it on the same line. Minus AB, audio bit rate to be 64K. And now an MP3 extension. So take our input video, don't grab the video, take the input movie I'll call it, don't grab the video, the audio codec, convert it to MP3 and use audio bit rate 64 kilobits per second and done and you can check and see if it plays see it map the AAC input audio to MP3 output audio bit rate 63.9 kilobits per second And of course, with different codecs and different bit rates, you'll get different file sizes and different quality. So quite easy to extract the audio from a movie and convert it to a particular format that you desire. Of course, we can also convert uh, what have we got? We could take the AAC as input and convert it to a different format. I don't know. WMA. Okay. So a similar way that we can convert videos, we can convert audio only files. Take the audio file input audio file, output, and usually FFmpeg will determine based upon the file extension what codec to use. So here I selected .wma, the Windows Media Audio. And it runs, I hope, and then... So the, the command I used to create a different audio output. In some codecs, you may need to specify options. So with MP3, I specified the audio bit rate. Okay. The default may have been, I think, was 128, but I set it to 64. So depending on what you want as an output, there are many different options that FFmpeg provides. And that's when it gets complex. This command is easy. Input file, output file. If it works, good. But if you want to do something a little bit more peculiar, then you need to maybe learn some of the options, which become more complex. And which I don't know, so you need to read the man page. Uh, what's next? Any questions on video? We're going through quite fast. Again, the intention is that you will 
be aware that FFmpeg exists, PDFTK exists, WGET exists, and maybe if you need it for your task, to learn a little bit more about them in your own time to use them for what you need it for. We cannot teach you everything here. Questions? We have a plan to finish at three. I'll be here, but uh, maybe we'll just do one more thing and then we can do as, as you wish. But any, any requests for this last one more thing? Any requests what we want to do regarding to, so we can keep converting audio and video, we can, what have we missed? Scroll down. Screencasts, record audio from microphone. Uh, and it, we don't have a microphone. I do, you don't. Let's try the last thing as a screencast. What is what is this? What is that? Well, what does that question mean? Uh, well, you, many different answers. Well, what does it show us? Well, first it shows us student at NetLab24 tilde dollar. And I think you've been typing commands. You may have seen it change sometimes. What does it, information does it show us? Student is the username. I'm logged in as student. At NetLab24 is the host name, the name of my computer. I'm actually logged into the computer at the back. Yours would be NetLab12 or whatever the computer number is. So that's the name of the computer. Colon, the tilde represents your current directory. Tilde, remember, is your home directory. Slash home slash student. This is just a shortcut. And dollar means from now on, everything beyond that you type. This is called the prompt. Okay. And the prompt, in this case, can provide some useful information, who I am, what computer I'm on, what directory I'm in. Why do we care who I am? I could log in as someone else. I can actually, I don't know if you can, but I can switch to uh, instructor. I need the password. You could probably guess it. Now I'm logged in as instructor on this computer and now it shows me I'm instructor. So that's useful information in that it reminds us who we're logged in as. This reminds us what computer we're on. You've already used Secure Shell to log into other computers at the start to run this MUX to, to view my terminal. Sometimes you forget, you run a command, you think you're doing it on your computer but you're actually logged into another computer. So this is a little bit of a reminder. Which computer are you logged into? And this is a reminder of where you currently are, your path. This is called the prompt. And what we type beyond the dollar sign is what is executed. Let's log out of instructor. We can change the prompt very quickly. Uh, first, the things that we're going to do, most of the commands that I've that we're going to demonstrate are on one of these two web pages. And these are linked to from the Moodle workshop. You go to the workshop, the resources, there's aliases, prompts and scripting, and wget, pdftk, and so on. Those two websites, I list most of the commands we're about to do this afternoon. So it may be useful now to open the website, and you may be able to even follow along there. Uh, we will not do all of them. So this one on aliases, prompts and scripting has some information about ma manual pages, man pages. We will not do that now. Have a read through in your own time. Then it has something on, there's some more new information there. Aliases, we may not do that at all. I'll scroll down a lot. Shell prompt. Okay. So the things I'm about to type some of them are 
most of them are on this website. Okay? So you have your own reference for later. Echo, we saw towards the end this morning that Echo displays something on the screen. What something? The, the, the parameter. Echo hello, prints hello on the screen. But in the shell, right, what is the shell when I say the shell? The language that this terminal uh, interprets, we refer to as the shell. Okay. So the commands that we have here uh, and the, the way it outputs things, the shell is the piece of software that, that manages all of this. In, there are different shell programs. The one we're using is called Bash, B-A-S-H, born again shell, but there are others. Now, the shell is like a language. It's almost like a programming language. We'll see some constructs later. Uh, but we can have variables. Think of them environment variables. In Windows, you may have set the path. The path is an environment variable. We can do the same thing in, uh, in Linux and other Unix operating systems. So, echo hello, prints the string hello, we can create a variable, whatever I like to call it, like this. And we can echo the contents of that variable. This is not about the prompt, this is just something about the shell. I can create a variable, ABC, by assigning it to some value, in this case a string, Steve, and I can display or I can uh, refer to the value of that using dollar followed by the variable name. We'll use them as we go through some examples. A variable. Uh, sometimes we enclose the variable with uh, sort of the, the full ways to enclose it with curly braces. The same thing. Dollar followed by the variable name or dollar in closed in curly braces the variable name. Just two different syntax. So, there are some variables which are defined in the shell already. I just defined ABC, and I can define others, but there are some already, already defined environment variables. One of them is the format of the prompt, and it's called PS1. So the variable name that defines the format of the prompt is PS1. Some strange string. Echo dollar PS1 some strange string. Forget about this Debian ch root and so on. Again, we don't have time to cover everything. Look at the last few characters. It tells us the format at which the prompt should be printed on my screen. And I've known, I studied before, that slash u means display the username. At Slash H means display the host name, the computer name. Colon slash W display the working directory. And then slash dollar means show an actual dollar sign because it's a special character. So these characters define how the prompt is displayed. We can change them. PS1 equal to, I'll put it in quotes, uh, You can change it to whatever you like. You can define it as just a string, or you can use these special characters to get uh, particular values. So PS1 is just a variable which defines the structure of the prompt. If you look through the man pages, you'll see w the definitions of these special characters and many others. And that's not what I'm doing today. You can find them in your own time. That's just a, a quick explanation of the prompt and let's change to maybe something different. Do we need a dollar? I think we should do dash.
Okay, so change the prompt to whatever you like. Uh, in this case, I've changed it to just display the username, followed by a dollar sign, space, and then what I type in. That's the prompt. In the website, there are a few more examples of the prompt which we will not go through. You can change the color. Okay. So the terminal in the basic form is black and white, or just two colors. But most computer systems support multicolored terminals. So we see the different colors of the directories and files. We can also change the color of the prompt. Uh, I'll copy and paste one from the website so they don't have to waste my time typing it. Uh, I think I've made a mistake on the website too. What? Maybe not. Okay. We can change the color. Okay, amazing. With this long set of commands, some of those strange characters define the color. This slash e in brackets one colon thirty four m defines the color to be blue of the prompt. Again, I copy that from the web page. Remember to copy and paste. Go to the web page. Select. You don't need to right click. Just select, go to your terminal, and middle click. Okay. Now we have a beautiful prompt. Some things that this afternoon we'll go through quickly just to make you aware of those things. Like you're aware that this is the prompt and you change it by setting PS1. Exactly how to do it, what possible values you can set, I'll let you explore in your own time. We, uh, we will not go into any more detail. The website, that web page, has some more details and also will point you to where to find more information. That's the prompt. Can I go back to normal? Uh, what was it at the start? Uh, I think it might have been this. If you want to go back to the original one, you can copy it from the website or, much easier, exit. Type exit, the terminal will close. When you start the terminal again, it will go back to the original. Okay. So the changes only apply, it's not permanent, only applies during this terminal. To make it permanent, we'll see how later. Okay. It's not too hard. We'll see it with something else. So for you, I will not do it, but you can exit and start a new terminal. Another variable. When I run ls, ls is a program. It's an application. Where is it? Which ls tells me ls, the executable file, in Windows it would be an exe file, ls.exe, here it's just ls, is in the slash bin directory. Why does my shell know, when I type ls, why does it know to execute ls from the bin directory? There may be a copy of ls in other directories. It knows from what we call the path. The path defines what directory should we search to find an executable. And it's just another variable. If you echo dollar path, dollar path is the variable, dollar refers to the value, 
echo will print out that value, shows a set of directories separated by colons to say that when you try and run a program, the shell will look in these directories in order. It will first look in home student bin and then, or I've got home student bin again, that's a mistake, and then these other directories. I set something up yesterday that uh, made home student bin repeat. So this is the path. You can change it. I don't suggest you do. Now, just make sure that you do have home student bin in your path and at the start. Some of you may not if I didn't set the computers up correctly. This is saying when I run a program the shell will look in this directory first to see if that program exists. If it doesn't exist there, it will move to the second directory. If not there, it will keep going. If it doesn't exist in any of these directories, it will return an error, command not found. Normally home student bin is not in your path. I have added it because we have some software that we're going to create ourselves that we'll put in this bin directory that uh, we want to use during uh, this afternoon. Anyone not have slash home student bin at the start of their path? Not have it? Who doesn't have it twice? Having it twice, it shouldn't be there twice, that's my mistake. But it won't hurt. If you want to add something to the path, maybe echo will take a... Uh, let's try. I had a variable, we'll do it with something else. I had ABC. Echo, you can combine variables and strings. So I have my variable ABC, which is defined to be Steve. If I try to echo dollar ABC hello, it doesn't return anything. It prints out empty space, that didn't work. But if I enclose ABC in the curly braces, echo ABC followed by the string hello, it prints Steve hello. So it's very easy to combine values together, con con concatenate the strings. We can do the same with a path. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Echo, dollar, and that's why we should put things in curly braces. If you had a new directory called new bin, I'm just making it up, we could add it to the path. That is, we can concatenate the existing path and add on this other string at the end, which would include a new directory. And to set that, we would say path equals existing path plus the old path, uh, plus the new directory. Set the path to be equal to the existing value of path combined with this new directory which would effectively add that to the to the path. Uh, just a reminder of course you can look on here but you should be able to see what I'm typing via the terminal if you're using MUX but if you shut it down or for some reason not working anyone not have the terminal open? If, if you, if you Okay, you can see it. All right, I think most people are okay. Uh, just make sure. So instead of having to see up there, Mux is working okay. All right, good. Just to make sure. Are you going to set your path? Press enter now and that second, that directory will be added to your path. I don't want it there, so I'm not going to press enter. But you can do it, it won't hurt. 
Okay, we'll do it. Now my path is everything as it was before, plus slash home slash student slash new bin. Okay. Which means when I run a program, what the shell does, it searches through all of these directories to look for that program. Ask questions as we go, otherwise we'll just quickly move on to the next, uh, next thing. Is that a question at the back or is that a yawn? I think it's... <laughs> okay. Now what we're going to do is put the commands that we've been running. Remember we run a command, press enter, run a command, press enter, put them inside a file and run that file. A text file. So I'll just clear, we'll start again. We'll use my text editor, Nano. For you, you may want to have multiple terminals open. That is, three terminals. Two of them for your computer and one to see what I'm doing. Sometimes it's useful to have two terminals. Maybe open an editor in one and execute in the second. But I will not just for the limited screen space. Let's create an example. If I can spell. No, example, example one. Remember, file extensions mean nothing in Linux. It doesn't matter what file extension I add. It doesn't matter if I don't include a file extension. It doesn't have to be .txt. In this case, I'll just call it example one. Nano is our text editor, like Notepad. And now we can put commands in there. What? CD home LS. LS minus N. L. That is, I want these three commands to be executed when I run this example one file. Rather than having to type each command myself, put them in a file and run that file that will run those commands. So I've just put three commands as an example should take me home, cd tilde means go to my home directory, should ls, and then ls in the long format. Exit, control x, save modified buffer, yes, y for yes, file name, press enter. You want to check if it's there, cat just shows you the contents. Now, how do we run it? I want to run the commands inside example.1. Well, the name of our shell is called bash. And the way to run, one way to run this example.1 is to type bash example.1. Remember to use tab. Bash e tab. Autocomplete. Bash is the shell which will execute, in this case, should execute the commands inside this file. Does it? Yes. You see the output of those three commands. The first command had no output. It just moved me into a directory. The second command, it's not so nice on my screen, but the second command was ls. It shows these files. And the third command, ls minus l, which shows those files in long format. There's what's called a shell script, a script which allows you to automate tasks. Any problems with shell scripting? Very easy. Just put your commands inside a text file and run that text file. Did it not work for someone? Anyone? Or maybe a better question. Who got it to work? Put your hands up. Yes, sure. Okay. If you didn't get it to work, did it run? Yep. Okay. Very easy. Now, 
let's cover a few more details about those shell scripts and to see a few different things we can do inside them. I'm going to open mine in my text editor again. Nano example one. It's good practice so we can just include the commands, but it's good practice to in fact include a special instruction at the top of the file to say which shell program to use to execute this. And it's a very special syntax. The first line should be hash exclamation mark and then the, the exact path to the shell script the interpreter. And we're going to use bash for all our examples. If you don't know what this means, don't worry. Just use it in the top of all your shell scripts. It doesn't have to be bash. It can be others. In fact, others may be better in some cases, but we will use bash for simplicity in our case. Hash is normally a comment in shell scripts. Anything after a hash is usually a comment. In this special case of the first line, when it's combined with the exclamation mark, it's not a comment. It's a special instruction saying, if you execute this file, use bash to execute it. Don't use some other interpreter. Hash exclamation mark, hash exclamation mark is called bang. So this combination is called shebang. Hash bang, shebang. So include that at the start of your scripts. When you execute it, control X, save yes, enter, again. Run it, you get exactly the same. Nothing has changed with regards to the output. Uh, let's do something different. Let's move the example one file into your bin directory. Remember, move will take this file and put it into another directory. So it moves it. It doesn't copy. We're doing this because our path includes the bin directory. What we want to do is be able to run this command without having to type bash example one. I want to just type example one. So we'll set that up. Move it into bin. And let's cd into the bin directory. There's already some programs in there from some I've installed, FFmpeg. And example one is there. Again, something that you may not understand but you need to accept for today with limited time. We need to make this program executable. Currently, example one, we are allowed to read it, we're allowed to write it, we're not allowed to execute it. We want to be able to execute it. How do we make it executable? This magic command. Change the mode such that the user can execute example one. And now we see an X here. All right. Again, permissions, changing the mode is something that we may cover in the lab in semester two for those that haven't taken it or in something like ITS 335, IT security if you're an IT student. Uh, but we will not cover today. You see the colors change to green. That's a nice sign. Example one is now an executable file. And because it's in the bin directory, and the bin directory is in my path, I can just type example one. And it executes. Yep. Sorry? Okay. So you should be able to just type, uh, you don't have to type bash example one, just type example one. If it works. Change the mode. Now, where's the command? Sorry. Uh, all right, I need to scroll. Sorry. 
something that I did which we didn't explain much. You must do this. CH mod U plus X example one. Make that program, make that file executable. Then you should better run example one. Anyone else have problems? Okay. So we now have our own program, example one, which actually just calls other programs, ls and cd. Let's do some more things with a script. Let's copy example one to example two. We'll go through a few examples. Uh, or a, a quick one. Now let's edit example two. Nano example two. Open up example two in your text editor. And let's change it to be something more interesting. Sorry, what did I do then? In nano, to delete a line, I can do control K, cut. Control K. You can delete normally. Let's create a variable. Don't copy me. set a variable to some value, the first line here, and then echo some string, my name is, followed by the value of that variable. Save and execute. I'll leave it up there for a moment. You can save that, execute, exit nano, and execute example two. Save. A quick way to save is just exit. Control X, save, yes, enter. Execute. Example two. All right. So this is just our use of variables. Same on the command line. We can use them in scripts. Next, the shell. We've all we've done so far is run a command and it, we get the output. Well, it has more complex syntax and it allows different programming con constructs. It allows what well, we'll use for loops, if statements, while loops, and many other constructs. So we'll just introduce for loops and then if statements. And we'll do it inside the shell script. I'll just keep copying in my example to a new one, just so I could have a record of the old files. Copy example two to example three, and then edit example three. I don't want those lines, let's make something more interesting. For loops, the syntax, there's different types, there's different uh, yeah, types of syntax for for loops. Let's go through a few common ones. For two left braces. For, for example, i equal to one. This is similar to C syntax. i less than three i plus plus, where i is our variable. Semicolon to close. Do. And I'll use a tab just to indent. You don't have to. Echo dollar i. Done. A simple for loop. So we're just trying to introduce you to the syntax. 
what you put inside here, well, it can be as complex or as simple as you like. Here we're just echoing the value of i. You could put in your own commands, ls, copy files, whatever you want to do inside that for loop. So the syntax, two uh, left parentheses, i equal to 1, semicolon, i less than equal to 3, semicolon, i plus plus to increment i. Yep. Why would you not have 2? How many do you want? Just 1. Why? Why not a square bracket, a square brace? Why not a hash? It's just the syntax. Okay. Uh, now, why did they choose, so the designer of this language why did they choose this syntax? I don't know, I have to ask the designer. But I suspect uh, something to do with uh, brackets are used a lot in shell for other purposes. So I suspect using a single one may have been conflicting with other purposes of the bracket. Okay. In fact, I think this is a new addition, relatively new compared to the early versions, these, this syntax. Let's, while we're here, well no, let's execute. Save, control X, save and, and run your example just to be sure you know what's happening. Example three, magic, one, two, three. Once it's run, then edit again and we'll add a few more examples of the for loop syntax. Anyone not get one, two, three? Okay, at the back. All right. Then open it again, and we'll add some different syntax. Another syntax for uh, some variable in some list, list of strings for example, semicolon to close, do, whatever you want to do, echo the name, done. So just a different syntax for the four, uh, the, the loop conditions. This is the typical C where you increment a counter for example. Here for name in this list of string values. So in the first instance name will be Steve and then it will be Tanarak and then Pekini. Okay. And I think we've got one more. We can use similar syntax and this will introduce a new shell operator. Instead of defining the list here, Steve, Tanarak, Pekini, Sometimes it's useful to define those list of values in a file, say a text file, one per line. And then get the for loop to read that text file. And one way to do that, I'll write it. I forgot to create the data. Actually, let's go back and create the data. I'll come back to that one. Let's save our file. If you've got that line there, that's okay, but I want to create the data first. Save the file, exit. We'll come back to it in a moment. And now let's create some fake data. Data1.txt, I'll call it, .txt. nano data onetxt and let's put some data in it and it, you can either type it yourself or if you can go to the website I have an example I'll show you if you again the website is Linux command line aliases prompts and scripting scroll down find our examples of shell scripting example where do we get to data onetxt I'm going to copy and paste these three lines. So if on the website, if you don't want to type it, you're lazy like me, you go to the website, copy, which is just select. 
I'll go back to that and go to nano and middle click paste. So on the website under for loops, there's an example that says cat data1.txt. I'll zoom in. Under for loops, this is the data I want in the file. It means nothing. Okay, it's just something that we can use as an example. If you can't copy it, you have to type something yourself. Just those three lines, starting with one, two, three, ending with GHI. So your file data one looks like that. Save it. Yes, just to check, cat data one. Okay, data one contains those three lines of text. What are they? Just some random one, some, some strings separated by uh, commas. We'll use those commas as field separators in a moment. Three lines with three fields each. Now go back to our example three and finish our for loop. Open example three in nano. Press enter. And we'll add one more for loop, the third for loop. And again, if you're lazy, you can go to the website and copy the for loop. Just make sure everyone has that so far. Okay. All right, and then we'll go back to the, the for loop. Again, if I go too fast, then you need to let me know or just ask one of your neighbors for a bit of quick help. Back in my example three, let's add the third for loop. For line in cat data1.txt, semicolon, do, and we'll do what we want to do. But let's first look at this syntax. So line is just the variable. We can call it what we like. It doesn't have to be line, it can be ABC, anything. It's a variable. And it's going to take the values of the output of this command. Note these, uh, these characters called the, the backtick operator sometimes, backtick. So the, the apostrophe leaning backwards. It's not a normal apostrophe. It needs to be the correct one. And cat data1.txt. What does cat data1.txt do? It just displays the contents of that file. Putting it inside these two backtick operators means that the output of this command, those three lines of file, will be taken as the, the information for this for loop. And it's read line by line. So the effect will be, and we'll see it, is that line will take the first line of this file, then in the next iteration the second line of the file, and then the third line of the file. There should be three iterations there, one for each line of data1.txt. If line is confusing, rename it to, uh, I don't know, L. It doesn't have to be line. Let's do something with each line. Echo the line and pipe it into cut. Cut takes some string, cuts it based upon some field delimiter. Our field delimiter minus D is the comma and the field that I want is field number two. Remember our, our lines were delimited by commas? Save and run. And just make sure it does what you expect it to do. Use the website to, to get the exact syntax. If, if I've gone too fast there, you can get it from the website. Did it work? Okay, easy. Okay. Good. Good. 
So we take L will take in the first iteration the first line and then the second iteration the second line and the third iteration the third line will echo a line and then we'll pipe that into cut which if we delimit by commas will take field 2. Yep. So the cat data1.txt means execute cat data1.txt and the output of that by using these two backtick operators these two means the output of that will be the input whereas if we typed the output of that here on the on the in the file we'll see another example of those backtick operators I think shortly they're quite important let me run mine. You should see something like that, depending on how you change the values. Three, four loops. The last one prints the second field of those three lines of that file. Of course, Inside your for loop, for loop, you put whatever you like. We're just using simple things for this, just to learn the syntax of the for loops. Let's keep going. Example 4. Copy example 3 to example 4. Edit example 4. Uh, and we'll show some cases of if statements. The first one, we'll do it inside a for loop. Instead of printing one, two, and three inside the first loop, let's include an if statement. Let's introduce a variable, I'll call it cutoff two F's, cut off, and set it to two. I should be one, two, and three. Our cutoff is going to be two. Let's introduce the syntax for if statements. If, and they're quite complex, well, not obvious sometimes, compared to other programming languages. If I, dollar I is the value, is less than, minus LT, less than, the cutoff. And that condition is enclosed in square brackets and they're important. They tell the if statement to, to test this uh, statement. To test if i is less than cutoff. And I think you need the spacing correct here. Uh, I think if you don't have a space after the left uh, after the, the left square bracket before the dollar it may not work. Then if that is true then echo some message dollar i is less than cut off. Else, else if, E L I F. So else if, do another test. Dollar I equals cut off. Then echo some other message. Dollar I is same as cut off. I'm typing it myself. Sometimes I make some typos and make mistakes. We'll find them later. If you don't want to type it yourself, you've got two options. Copy it from the website. You'll get everything. Or just copy from the terminal as I type. All right. If, if you don't want to type it, then copy it from what you see 
uh, in your other terminal. But try and understand the syntax. And else. Echo something else. Dollar I is not less than cut off. You don't need the semicolon at the end of these echoes. Won't make any difference. Close the if with fi. What's the opposite of if? fi. And we have our first example of if statement. So this is one syntax where we're comparing in numbers. So dollar i is an integer, is a number, and cutoff is a number. So we can compare them with less than, equal to, and you guessed it, there's gt for greater than, there's le for less than and equal to, or equal to, and a few others. Shall we run it? Run it just to make sure you've made no mistakes. You can save. Control X, yes, example four. Okay, so I iterates from one, two, and three. Inside each iteration, a the if statement tests the value of I against our cutoff. It's just introducing the syntax. Best to do it here. There are other ways to do it, but this is just uh, a quick way to get started. Any questions? It worked. Uh, press FG. Control X. Now run it. Yeah, the first three lines. Oh, dollar cutoff, not percent cutoff. If you if you make typos, then sometimes you'll get syntax errors or or strange results. So you just need to be careful, as with any programming, to get the syntax correct. Okay, let's quickly get a couple more if statements. Let's continue to edit that file, example 4. That was one form of syntax where we compared numbers. We can do string comparison in our second for loop where we listed the three names. If, and I'll enclose it in double quotes, if name, and a good practice is to include the curly braces. If name, here we use equals to do string comparison. Then echo. Fi closes the if statement. Okay, so there are no, I don't know, curly braces like in C to open and close. We use fi to close. Then echo. something. And while we're here, let's add another one. So this one is just comparing strings. So we can use equals. Minus EQ to compare numbers equals to compare strings. And it's good practice to have everything in double quotes to make sure it is a string. Because if dollar name was an integer, then we'd be comparing a, a number against a string, which may be a problem. So it should say, it should iterate through the three names, and when it gets to Tanarak, it will echo out a string. Last one. Here we did, what do we do? Uh, 
here we did a cat on data1.txt. But what if the file did not exist? If there was no such file data1.txt, then this script would return an error if we try to cat a file that's not there. So it's good practice to check and see if it exists before we use it. And we can do an if statement. If and minus e means if the file exists, then this is not very useful because what if it doesn't exist? But I'll just introduce the syntax and we'll fix it. Minus e is a special operator is used for testing about files and directories. Minus e means if the file exists. So if data1.txt is a file and it is present in the directory, then this will return true and will echo it exists. If there's no such file, then this conditional statement will return false. Maybe we'd like to do not. If it doesn't exist, then if the file is not there but we want it to in the next for loop, then we should exit not uh, the exclamation mark is a, uh, a n negation here so if data1.txt does not exist if I've got the syntax correct then echo this error message and exit this script don't continue that's what this exit means it means we will not go into the for loop we shouldn't because the for loop relies on this file if it doesn't exist then we should stop I may have made a mistake with the syntax. We'll come back to it. Let's test and see if it works. Run example four. Tanarak is my boss and it pro shows those values. And let's move data one to be data two. Therefore data one would not exist. Then it handles that case. I'll show you the, the if statement in a moment, but just check if it does what you expect. When you see syntax error, something's gone wrong. Don't continue. Look on, open up the website, and to get things clear, copy and paste from there to overwrite so you're back to a, a, a working example. So the idea is we check if a file exists before we use it. Everything works, but you're getting errors. To me, that means not everything works. Errors, warnings and errors are not good. Okay. What's it say? Is there a way to check the line? Here, how do I get the line? Control C. Uh, maybe a space here. Try to use, I'm not sure, but I think a space there. Yeah. That fix some um, minus E, uh, space before the minus E. Yep. Yeah. Make, oh no, yeah, okay. If, uh, right, line nine. So, Nano. And control C will tell you the line. Line three, so you scroll down a very primitive. Scroll down. What's wrong? If less than try a space after E L I F. I'm not sure. I think it's acceptable. If something's wrong, I'm try. 
different. Again. No, there's a problem at the start, uh, but I can't see it. Or do if then echo ah, after the echo a space echo, echo yeah Can save. Still an error down on line 16. Okay. Oh, I think you've got two duns. Four, only the for loop needs a done. So the second done is not. How do you change? Uh, similar, if you go to my, the website, there's an example about the prompts. And, but I, don't try it now, it's, it's quite confusing. But you, you'll find it later. Line 15, again, the duns. Uh, only one done. You need one done for one do. Okay, yep. Delete one. Delete done. Yep. And here as well. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. To find the line number inside Nano, you can use Control C, and it will show you the line number. So if you've got an error, scroll down, press Control C, scroll down, scroll. Okay, Control C, line thirty-six. So. The minus e in that conditional statement was a special character, a special uh, operator to say if a file exists. There are many others. If a file, if it's a directory, if it's a d file of a particular type. To find out all of those uh, operators, where am I? These square brackets are implementing a test. Okay? And to find out about the syntax, the program is actually called test. So man test will explain the syntax. The square brackets is just a short form of using the program test. And if you scroll through, you'll see all the, the different uh, operators that you have available. And or string comparison, integer comparison, uh, file checks. Is a file a particular type? Does it exist? Is it a directory? And different things. So you can do checks on files. Very useful if you want to automate tasks, tasks on files. You want to check if it exists before you do something with it. Q to quit. Do we have one more example, shell script? One quick example to finish shell scripts, because we want to move on. Uh, I'm going to copy. I know if you didn't get it working, we'll come around and uh, even if you, if you still have trouble with examples one to four, maybe put your hand up and one of the others will come around and help while I try and present, uh, just so we can keep moving. Um, or I'll come around after I go through example five. Let's do example five, last thing. I'm going to copy example one, our very first one, to example five. Doesn't matter which one, but example one was the shortest. And edit, sorry, 
edit example five, our last shell script example. We can use input parameters. What's the case? So anything that starts with a dollar sign refers to a ver the value of a variable. But there are some special cases. Dollar one refers to the first input parameter to this command. Dollar two, the second input parameter. These are called positional parameters. So ls minus l dollar one. So when I run this script, I must enter in a parameter on the command line. Piper into grep dollar two ls minus l dollar one pipe grep dollar two save and run it and we need to pass in two parameters dollar one will be replaced by the first parameter and dollar two by the second parameter and I just for this example Example 5 had inside the script $1 and $2, they will be replaced with the first and second parameter on the command line. And just for this example, it was ls minus l sum directory, user slash bin, pipe it into grep and search for a string. The string I'm searching for is VLC, which means find me all files in that directory which have the name VL or have the string VLC in their name. And it shows you CVLC, NVLC, and a few others. So this is just an example of positional parameters or input parameters to a script. Which means you can create a script that takes parameters as input and then reuse that script uh, and it can be more generic than if it's specific to uh, the files and, and directories and strings. That's our last shell script, last example, before we move on to some other things. Questions? The things our shell scripts did were not very interesting. It's up to you to put the commands inside to make it do what, what you want it to do. We just introduced the syntax. Everything okay now? Yeah? Easy? You need two parameters. Where are we going? 50 minutes, okay. With, with Linux, most of the commands we run, sometimes they take an input, like an option or a file, and produce some output. Let's look at the concepts of the input and output of programs. And I've got a presentation. It's on the it's in the ITS332 directory on your computer. It's called what is it called? Linux standard interaction. Standard input, output, and error. These are concepts which become quite important when we want to build complex commands in on the terminal. We think we run a command. The input to that command is referred to as standard input. STDIN is the short name, the standard input. So often we run a command and it takes some input. We haven't seen many today, but we can use uh, an input to determine what that command will do. The output is what's printed on the screen. You run the command of ls and it shows a set of lines on the screen. That's the output that's referred to as standard output. If you run a command and there are errors, 
then that's distinguished from the normal output and it's called standard error. I'll show you an example. LS, the standard output is this line, these lines of text. That's the standard output. ABCF, I tried to run a command that didn't exist. My terminal shows me ABCF command not found. This is an error message and it's although it's shown on the screen it's referred to as standard error so when you run commands the normal output is standard output error messages are distinguished and sent to what's called standard error so we have input to commands output normal output and error output simple and the input is typed on the terminal and the standard output and by default standard error are displayed in the terminal Normally when we type command, the input, we type on the terminal, it's what we type in response to the command, and the output's displayed on the terminal. Now, we can change that. Uh, we can redirect the output to a file. So normally the output, the standard output displayed on the terminal, what we can do is send the output to a file and save it in a file. This is called redirection. And to redirect to a file, we use the greater than sign. Let's try it. LS, normally the output of LS is shown on the screen. redirect using the greater than sign and then a file name. You can choose whatever file name you like. Press enter and see what's shown on the screen. Nothing. So the the output of the command is no longer shown on the terminal. Where is it? It's in the file out.txt. Have a look. So the file now contains what normally would have been printed on the screen. So we redirect the output of the command from the terminal. Instead, from the terminal, we send it to a file. Very useful if you, you want to look at that output later. So that's redirecting the standard output to a file, use the greater than sign. You can redirect both the output and error messages to a file using this special two characters of ampersand greater than. So note the difference here. The greater than sign shows only the normal output and saves that in a file. Any error messages are still displayed on the screen. Uh, I'm not sure if I can find an example. Let's try. Uh, what about our find? I'll just scroll through. Before we searched in our file system for PDF files, let's, instead of display the output on the screen, display it into my file called... Uh, I don't care what the name is. So run this find command and every, every file we find, save it in this file, x.txt. What happens? It runs, but the error messages, these permission denied messages, are shown on the screen. So the normal output is, shown in, is saved to a file, but the error messages are still shown on the terminal.
tilde, the tilde character that I type, the squiggly line, is means my directory, my home directory. So the command I executed was saying, I think it wasn't necessary there, but uh, what I executed was find, save the output, the standard output, in my home directory, a file called x.txt. If you look in x.txt, using less, you should see the files which were the PDFs. Okay, the whole list of PDFs. So note there's a difference between standard output, the normal results, and error results, standard error. If you want to redirect the errors to the file as well, add the ampersand character. I hope it works. Yes, okay. So now if you look in x.txt you'll see the files found plus those error messages. The error messages are caused because I don't have permissions to read some directories. So redirection, we can redirect different things. There are many different ways to do it. Redirect the standard output to a file. Redirect both the standard output and the error messages to a file. We can redirect a file to standard input. I will not show an example now, we'll see one maybe this afternoon. That is, if a command takes input, instead of typing that input, you can take the input from a file. So it's as if you've already typed it into a file, run that command using the, what you typed into the file as input to that command. So read from the file the input. We'll see one this afternoon of that. Next thing. So this is redirection. Change where the input and output comes from and goes to. Piping. Normally when we run a command, the output is text. Well, what we can do is run a command, it produces output, and take that output and send it into another command. And that second command executes using the output of the first command as input. It's called a pipe. And the character we use is the vertical bar. Take the command, first command, execute it, the output is then used as input to the second command. And the output of the second command is then in this case shown on the screen. Let's see an example or a few examples of a pipe. When we do ls, I see the list of files. Uh, ls minus l shows you the details. I can pipe the output of the ls, in this case the ls minus l with all the details, and filter it uh, and send it to a new command and I'll use grep to search for a particular word. So my aim, list all the files and of that list print just the lines which contain the word tears. and you see the two lines from the ls which contain the word tears. Now we could have done the same thing just using ls in this case. Just an example of take the output of the first command and then pipe it in to the input of the second command. And then you can have actually multiple commands. And using pipes and redirection is a very powerful to build up complex commands based upon very simple ones. Uh, as an example from our introduction to the course or the 
the poster for the course. This is a command. Don't try and run it. Sorry, I've got the slideshow on. This is one long command, actually. The slash in the end just means it goes, wraps around a line. You'll see this, or actually multiple commands, you'll see these vertical bars in here. Meaning, run some command. Here, run this tail command. You don't have to understand all of it, but run this tail command here and take the output of that and pipe it into this next command, tr. And there was a redirection there. A redirection from A redirected into F. So, more so this afternoon, we'll start to combine some com commands using pipes. Uh, let's give some more real examples. Remember, your aim today is to understand this command. Understand why did it print those four or five lines on the screen. Now, if you run the command today, it may not print the exact same lines, but uh, uh, it'll be close. Let's go back to our terminal for the last few examples. What else can we do? Let's say there are other ways to do it, but my ls-l showed me all files in detailed long format. grep tears shows me those lines which contain the word tears. And we see all these strings, this one line. Note that each line is space separated. These characters are space, one, space, student, space, student, and so on. And it's the same format. Let's say I just want to get the file size. Which field is it if it's space separated? The first field, the second field. We'll see how we can do that. Think of a space separated fields. The first field, the second, the third, fourth. The file size is the fifth field in that output. Let's pipe it into a program called cut, which can cut an input when the delimiter between fields is a space, minus d means the delimiter between fields, and we want the fifth field, sorry it's wrapped around, minus f space 5. Cut cuts text according to the spec you, you give it. And the spec I'm giving it is to say the fields are delimited by a space, I'll run it and then show it again if people cannot see, and the fifth field. It got one of them. Let's try again. And it prints this big 38, 380 megabytes. What about the second line? It doesn't print anything. Why? Why did it not work? Let's get, say, the first field. Instead of field 5, field 1. For each line, it prints field 1 if the fields are separated by a space. The first to the third field, 1 to 3 the first three fields. The first to the f fifth field. Something didn't go as I hoped. What went wrong? What went wrong is that there are in fact two spaces here. Okay, so cut separates fields by spaces. There's a single space here, meaning this is the fourth field, this is the fifth field. Whereas student on this line is the fourth field, there's a space, the fifth field is non-existent, there is no value. The sixth field is 83, so on. So cut is only 
separates by a single space in this case. So if our input has multiple spaces, it doesn't work very well. We can cut I like to see it at the top. We can even cut specific characters and pipe that into cut. Uh, cut the first field from our first output and then pipe that into another cut that ca cuts characters two to four. So the first field was these 10 characters. The next cut grabs just characters 2, 3, and 4, which is R, W, dash, R, W, dash. Okay. So cut is just a way to split up strings based upon uh, field delimiters, based upon characters, and a few other things. We'll make use of it in some further examples later. Uh, what else? Uh, redirection. So this is pipes. Of course, we could redirect all that to a file. Um, almost done. Some other shortcuts. I think everyone should have two terminals open, at least two terminals. One, you see what I type, and one is what you type. Of course, you can copy and paste. If, if you're lazy, you don't want to type something, copy and paste from one terminal to another. In most Linux systems, you can do a quick copy and paste by select, use your mouse, select, don't right click, select, so you will not be able to see it with me, but I can select something. If you want to select a word, you can double click. And now just move and don't right click, middle click, pastes. Paste what was selected. So just select as you would select anything with your left mouse button. Once you've selected what you want to copy, it's already copied. And then to paste it, middle click on your mouse, the middle scroll button, click that that pastes. What if you don't have a middle click? We were supposed to hold this lab in the Mac room and we were going to use VirtualBox, but they don't have a middle click, so you get a different mouse. Uh, but most mouses you can emulate a middle click with two buttons. So my, keyboard, my laptop, for example, has two buttons only. There's no middle button. Press them both at the same time emulates a middle click. And is usually the case on normal mouses, not on Mac mouses. So middle click, if there's no middle button, double uh, click left and right at the same time. So let's just finish with a few more shortcuts. Uh, can I remember some? You have a command. You want to change the something at the start. Press Control A. Moves your cursor to the start of the line. Control E to the end. Control A to the start of the line. Control E to the end. If you need to edit a long line, they are, are quite useful. If you want to delete something, you can use Control K. Control K to cut everything beyond the, uh, in front of the cursor. Control Y pastes. I'll do it again. I'll look where my cursor is. It's at the start of the cut. Control K deletes it. It actually cuts it. Control Y yanks or pastes that. So we can do some basic things for copy and paste, uh, cut and paste either using the keyboard or you can just use your mouse.
the mouse select and middle click is very powerful, or very, very quick to copy and paste. Any commands that we've missed that we may need this afternoon? Any questions as we head into the lunch break? The last five or ten minutes, so I think at maybe at 12 o'clock we'll go have lunch, so the next ten minutes just try some of the things, we'll come around and answer any questions. This afternoon, once you know the basics from this morning, we'll just do some other things like convert some videos, um, manipulate some PDFs, and create some scripts where we put a set of commands into a file and execute them all at once, okay, which can be much more powerful than just running them individually. So I'll stop talking now, so the last 10 minutes just try some different things, so we'll come around, ask any questions, and then we'll have a break. We're going to issue commands to do things on our computer, and the first basic thing that we're going to do is explore the file system. So the file system is, uh, in a simple terms, is made up of a set of directories and files. Okay. So let's do something with directories and files to get started. Uh, first command we'll try is pwd. And you type the command and press enter and it shows some output. PWD tells me about my present working directory. Okay. PWD, my present working directory. When I execute commands, I am in some directory when I execute them. Which directory? Well, PWD tells me I am in the directory called slash home slash student. That's typical for a user named student to be initially in the directory called slash home and followed by the username student. To view contents of directories, to list the files inside a current directory, we can use the program ls. ls lists the contents of a directory and in this case shows an output showing uh, five, different, five different entries. On your terminal, it may be different than mine. should be very similar, but it may be slightly different. We, our computers, uh, some things have changed on some of them. But you should see something like that. You need to ask questions as we go, otherwise I'll keep going. Put your hand up or just yell out if there's a problem. I cannot see everyone at the back, but I'll stay seated so I can um, type better. ls shows us the list of files and directories in our current directory. We'll look at that in detail in a moment. Um, a hint, in this case, the blue ones are directories, the other ones are files. So there are three directories or subdirectories. In Windows, you call them folders, maybe, but here we call them directories. So there are three subdirectories. Let's change into one, the one called ITS332. So change directory, we use CD, followed by the directory name. CD into ITS332, change into that directory. Press Enter. PWD. Now you'll see I'm in slash home slash student slash ITS332. So this represents your current directory and it's uh, what we call a full path or an absolute path. It's saying relative to the, the base of the file system or the root of the file system, we're inside the ITS332 directory, which is inside the student directory, which is inside the home directory. And the home directory is inside the root of the file system, the root directory. We'll see some more about the exact structure later, but let's just maneuver about the, the file system. How do you go back? I was in home slash student, now I'm in home student ITS332. How do I go back to home slash student? C 
CD, we can give this, the full, sorry, the full path to change to. CD into slash home slash student. Note the difference of our two CD examples. The first one we CD into ITS332. There is no slash at the front. This is a relative path. Change into the directory ITS332 relative to where we are. There's no slash here. Whereas the second case was change into the absolute directory slash home slash student which is relative to the root. So here we gave the full path. We can use either, a relative or an absolute path. There's other ways to maneuver about. Let's go back into ITS332. So to get back to student, we can think we have a hierarchy of directories and a shortcut to go up in the hierarchy is cd dot dot. Try it. Try it and see where you'll end up. So we have directories and you think of it as a tree. There's a root and then there's subdirectories and subdirectories and so on. So we think that we can move down in the tree and move back up in the tree. To move up we use the special directory dot dot. Means go up a directory. You don't need to, but just to so that it, it stays um, at the top of the screen, I'm going to use the, the uh, command clear. You don't need to do that. Clear will just bring me to the top of the screen. It will clear what we currently have. And I'll do some things again. Currently. So very simple concepts. We start in slash home slash student. We change into ITS332 using a relative directory. We're in home student ITS332. Then we go back. We CD up in the hierarchy which takes us back to slash home slash student. Let's explore a bit more of the directories. What about, let's go to the root of the file system, which is just slash. In Windows, if you're a Windows user, the root you'll often recognize as C drive, like C colon slash, or uh, that's the topmost uh, directory in our file system. Have a look, ls. So in the root of our file system we have a number of subdirectories and a few files even. The blue ones are subdirectories. Bin, boot, home, media, var and others. These are storing some of our user files and we'll note that inside the home directory the user files are stored where most of the others are storing parts of the operating system and applications. You don't need to know what all of these subdirectories do. I'll show you a slide lately, later with an explanation, but these are just subdirectories storing things like the operating system files, applications, uh, user files. Go back to your original directory, home slash student which we call our home directory. If I'm the student user, my home directory is where I start in the terminal, which is typically slash home slash the username. Go back there. So if I'm in the root to go home, different ways. C 
cd home slash student because I know that's this, the relative directory I want to go to and I'm back in home slash student. Or slightly different, I'm currently in root cd slash home slash student and again gets me back to home. What's the difference here between cd home slash student, cd slash home slash student? In this case, it has the same effect. This one is a relative, relative to where we start from, where we're starting in the root directory. So relative to that, go to home and student, whereas this is an absolute path. It ignores where we start from. In this case, it gives us the same result. Let's go to the root directory. There are a few shortcuts we can use. Instead of typing slash home slash student, I'll clear. I'm in the root directory. A shortcut for your home directory is this tilde character, the squiggly line. Tilde, I call it. That is used to replace your home directory. Try it. Okay, so there's a shortcut. If you ever want to refer to your home directory, you can use the tilde character. For example, we go back to the root. cd tilde slash ITS332 means change into the directory which is my home and the subdirectory ITS332. So tilde really is replaced with home slash student. So that use it as a shortcut to, to go home. And the faster way to go home is just type CD. CD with no parameters will take you home. Okay. So just an alternative. No matter where you are on the file system, no matter which directory you're in, if you want to get to your home directory, just type CD and enter and you'll get there. Any questions so far? Most of the commands we'll go through, we'll just use a few examples of them. There are many more features that most commands have that we will not cover. We'll show you how to read about the features later. We can move around. Maybe, what does the file system look like? We said in the root directory, there are some subdirectories. I've got a slide that tries to capture those subdirectories. Or some of them. It's usually common across different uh, Unix and Linux based operating systems. These slides are on, your, uh, on the website and on actually the ITS332 directory, but I'll go direct to one of them. The, the file system hierarchy usually has these common subdirectories of bin, home, lib, and so on. Bin is short for binary. Usually stores applications, binary applications. So if you look in the bin directory, you'll find many applications. Home is where your home is. Your home directory. So there can be many users on a single computer. The typical place for their home directories will be home slash username. In Windows, what's the home directory? I don't have Windows. Can anyone tell me? Where do you find your home directory in Windows? Or in OS X? In, in Mac, it's slash users slash the username, I think. Uh, I think if you look in a Mac, you'll actually see there is a home directory, but it doesn't use that. It uses slash users. In Windows, I can't remember, is it slash, slash users? 
or so, user files or something. Yeah. Document, yeah. So I think those who use Windows can find their home directory. I cannot. Lib is short for libraries. Libraries are files which usually applications share. In Windows, you will know them usually as DLL, DLLs. Okay? You'll have an application in EXE, and it may use a library of, of ex executable code in a DLL file. Okay? In Unix systems, we also have libraries which different applications share. Okay? Usually, in the basics, we don't deal with the bin and the lib directory. The slash root directory, don't confuse that with the slash directory. Slash root is the home of the root user. So there is a root user that is an administrator uh, called root. In Windows, usually it's called administrator. Okay. So they have a special home directory called slash root. Uh, we skipped over some. ETC usually con con contains configuration files. If you want to change something in the operating system, in Windows you use something like the registry. There are registry settings, and you can edit those registry, registry settings. In most Unix systems, the configuration of the operating system is done via text files, and most of them are in the etc directory. Slash user is really repeats what we see here, but at a different level. So we see binaries or applications, libraries, and some source and other files, which are again applications and application information. Var is variable things, usually websites. If your computer is a web server, if your computer is an email server, your emails will be stored here. There's usually a temp directory, and there are others. Okay. You don't need to know them. Uh, and it may be different on different systems, but often we'll see some of these common directories. Some of them are explained there, or, or very brief explanation. Let's go back into our file system. Let's go home. Let's make a directory. We make a directory using mkdir. Make mk for make dir directory. And then the directory name. Whatever you like. You don't have to copy me make a directory. Make sure you do it in your home directory. Okay. Uh, for those that come in, make sure they have tmux set up. Yep. tmux, you'll help him with tmux and you'll help him with tmux. Okay, Corinne? Good. Make a directory, it doesn't matter what you call it, but the output should be nothing. See, when I ran make directory, it just returns to what we call the prompt. There's no warning message or error message. If you see something different from this, something went wrong, probably. If you were in the wrong directory, for example, I was in the root directory, and I tried make directory ABC, I get an error message. You cannot create that directory. Permission denied. It means you, as, this, as the logged in user, do not have uh, the permissions to create a directory called ABC in this location. We're not going to talk about permissions, but I think you can uh, guess that some users can, uh, are restricted in what they can do on the file system. You, as the normal user, the student user, cannot delete all files from the file system. You cannot make directories wherever you like. You have limitations. Usually you do it in your home directory. So make sure you're in your home directory. LS, and you should see ABC. You shouldn't see hi. Someone's logged into my computer and, and made a directory. Okay, fine. Won't hurt me. Uh, okay. Make a directory, let's move on. Delete a directory, RM, RM for remove. MK for make, RM for remove, so delete. 
and it's gone. Let's move on. So, make directory and delete a directory. Now, the main things with directories, we can change, we can view our current directory, we can make directories, remove directories. Let's move on to files. Let's create a file. All right, let's cre start by creating a text file. Um, we'll use a text editor. There are many text editors on your computer. The one we'll use is called Nano, or I will use. Nano is a text editor, and you can pass in a file name whatever you like. You don't have to use the same file name as mine. And press enter and it will open up a text editor. Type some message in your text file and then we'll see how to save it. Find him a seat and get him on Tmux. Type in your text editor, type whatever you like in your text file. So the basic text editor on Windows is Notepad. But there are other text editors. You can install your own. Same on, on our Ubuntu Linux. We have Nano as a simple text editor, but there are many others. It gives us some screen where we can type some text. Now, we're not going to teach you how to use Nano except how to save files and exit. And note down the bottom of the screen it gives you some menu. The carrot, that hat character, means control. So control G is get help. Control X is exit. Control O is save. They are the main ones you need for today. Control O, write. Write the file means save the file. If you want to save the file, control O. It says, do you, which file name do you want to save it as? Well, the same one that I, I gave before, just press enter, and it's saved. If you want to exit, control X. If you try to exit before you save, it will give you some prompt. Do you want to save? Okay. So create a text file. Again, you can put whatever you like into it. You don't have to name it the same as mine. Let's do something with that text file. Yep? How can I change the directory of the saved file? How can I change the directory of the saved file? You mean put it somewhere else? Yeah. We'll move it. Okay, the question is how, how do I change the directory? Let's see where mine is, or where yours is. Let's do ls. Your file should be there. Okay. Again, you'll see a different set of directories or files than me, but you should see the one you just created. Let's put it somewhere else. So the question was, how do I change directories? Well, we move it to a different directory. MV. My new file. Move. You move something from a source to a destination. Move, MV, your file name. Where do you want to put it? Well, if you want to put it in another directory, type the name of the directory you want to put it in. Move my new file.txt into ITS332 directory. That shifts it into a different directory. LS, it's gone from here, but if I change into ITS332 and LS, it's one of those files amongst that list of files, my new file.txt. So MV move. Move a file from one location to another. 
all of the commands we're going through are on the reference card, so in a slightly different order, but we'll, we'll get through some of them. While we're on MV, MV, move, we can use it to rename files. Move my new file. Ah, before I go. Who can type as fast as me? Okay. Typing on the command line is very time consuming sometimes. There are many shortcuts we can use. Let's try and introduce a few as we go. The first shortcut which I find very useful Alright, there's a set of files in my directory. I want to move my new file somewhere else. So I type MV for move and then I start to type the file name M for my new file. And the command line has an autocomplete feature. You know when you're searching Google you t start typing in the keyword it presents options to autocomplete. Well to get autocomplete in the command line press tab, the tab character on your keyboard. If it does nothing, I just press tab, you didn't see it, but nothing changed, it means I cannot autocomplete that. It means there's no unique file that starts with M. I type the next letter in the file name, my new file, MY, press tab, it autocompletes. Why? Because in this directory there were two files that start with M. When I press tab after typing M it couldn't determine which one I wanted. But after I typed in Y, M Y, and press tab it auto completes to the one that matches. There's only one file that starts with M Y so that must be the one I want. So use tab, start to use it all the time because it uh, saves typing makes your life easier. If you, I'll try again, if you press tab nothing happens. If you press tab twice it will list the options. Okay, I've got MVM. I press tab two times and the command line shows me the two files that start with M. Just to remind me that in this directory there are two files that start with M. Ah, I now type Y, press tab, and it auto-completes. So if auto-complete doesn't work, press tab again and it will give you options of what starts with those particular letters. Now what are we doing? Renaming a file. Renaming a file is the same as moving a file from one name to another name. MV, my file name, to new name. Whatever you want to call it. Which is rename. And now my new file has disappeared. I now have a file called newname.txt. So MV is used for moving a file between directories as well as renaming files. While we're there, let's, let's copy the file, CP. CP for copy. So CP, the file name, the source file, the one you want to copy, and the destination, the new one you want to create, which is going to be identical to the source. And if I do LS, I'll see, hopefully, that this new one exists. Now, I'll come back to LS. We're going all over the place, but LS, we can pass parameters. If I do ls it shows me all the files and subdirectories. What if I just want to see the text files? We can use a wildcard like this. List all files which match any character. Star means any character. It's a wildcard. 
but finishes, finishes with .txt. Someone deleted my copy. I'm going to find out soon. We'll try again. You can do it better than me. I've got a file and I can copy it. Please don't delete it. Okay. LS, as with many, pro many programs, will take a parameter uh, to filter out which one's the list. And star is what we call wildcard, meaning match any value. So star.txt means any value that ends with .txt. You can use star in different ways. And there are, in fact, other patterns that we can match. lsc star, every file that starts with a C. And uh, you can have more complex patterns. So what have we got? We can copy, we can move or rename, we can delete. What did we delete? RM. Remove. Delete a file is to remove a file from the file system, so RM is the uh, command to delete a file. And it should be gone. Okay. RM removes a file. There's no trash. There's no recycle bin. If you remove, it's gone. Okay. Gone in that uh, you need uh, special techniques if you want to recover it. So it doesn't move into a trash or recycle bin. It's deleted. Okay. So be careful. Don't try and delete important files. Don't try and delete the operating system. Okay. Uh, we can copy, we can move, we can remove, we can edit with nano. Uh, let's go back to some of the commands we know and do a few different things with them. What? Let's come back to ls. ls lists the files. It has many options and on the command line options are usually given as a character following a dash. And we'll see how to find the options. Sorry, I'll just clear and go to the top of the screen. Again, you can do this on your computer. It may be different output, but uh, just try the different commands. ls shows the files. ls minus l shows the files in long format. And to make it, sorry, it doesn't look very good on my screen because my terminal's not big enough. The files wrap around. You can make your terminal bigger to, to make it look nicer on your screen. Okay, but let's try again. LS minus L show the output in long format. Give a lot of details. Star.txt of the text files. I'll just move it up rather than clearing. Look at this line here. What do you see? It gives them some details about that file. So the file name going back from the right back, the file name, the something about the date and time of the file, sorry, July 25, 10.54. Now with files there are different dates and times associated. There's usually creation time, modification time, when was it last modified, and access time, when was it last accessed. This is the modification time from memory, when it was last modified. 26 is the size of the file in bytes. 
This file is 26 bytes. Student and student is something about who owns the file. Whose file is it? The first student on the left means who's the user that owns it, and the second one means who's the group. But today we're not going to cover permissions, so we're not going to explain uh, that in any more detail. But the owner of the file, when our computer system may have many users, we need to indicate whose file it is. One I always forget. I'm not going to try and remember. The first set of characters are about permissions. Something telling us about who can read the file. Read means open. Who can write the file means edit, delete, change. And dash means usually it's the third character is execute. So the permissions in Unix are read, write, and execute. Read is opening. Writing is modifying, executing is executing, running it. Okay. These ten characters, no, of the ten characters, this, the last nine tell us about permissions on this file. And again, I don't want to spend time on explaining it. Three characters say what the user can do. The next three characters say what the group can do. And the last three characters say what everyone else can do with this file. I'm the user student. I can read and write this file. I cannot execute. Anyone in the group student can read and write this file. They cannot execute. Any user who's not student and not in the student group can only read the file. That's the way we interpret that. You need to go study a little bit more about permissions to, to go into more detail there. That's not for today. The first character indicates the type of file. The main types of files we have are files and directories. I'll go back a directory. Again, very hard to see on my screen, but you will see the blue ones, the first character is a D, meaning this is a directory. And the ones which are not blue, the first character is a dash meaning this is not a directory, it's a file. So that's how you really know if it's a file or directory. Not by the color, but by that first character in the output here, directory or file. So we can view the long format. Uh, what else? What about hidden files? I think you know on, say, on Windows you can have hidden files, ones which are not normally shown but they're actually there. Well, the similar concept we have, uh, what have we got? Uh, copy, what did I have? Do I have a file? Copy my ABC file from my ITS332 directory, so this is the source. I want to copy abc.txt from its332 directory into another file. And I could type, okay, so we'll create a file called another.txt. To make it hidden, put a dot in front of it. do an ls and you won't see dot another dot txt okay so the concept of a hidden file in unix is a file that's name starts with a dot okay dot files they're not hidden in terms of security usually you can find them quite easily but they're just hidden in terms of convenience they're not listed when we do ls in a, a normal operation. To list it, you need to do ls minus a, minus a for all files, normal files plus hidden files. And you see a bunch of hidden files and directories. And one of them should be the, the one that you just created. ls minus a. List all files.
Questions? Too fast? Too slow? Everything okay? Easy? All right? Okay. We'll move on. You can combine options. Try LS minus A minus L. That is, these dash minus A minus L are just options. You can usually combine them in any order. Not always, but in most cases. List all files minus A in long format. Right, doesn't look so nice there. Looks better on your screen. And there are many other options. Where do you find the options to LS? So now, how do we find help? Well, there are things called manuals or man pages, manual pages. If you know the command, I know the command to list files is ls. To read about all the details, I do man ls. Man is the program that will show you the, the help, the manual for this program. And you can scroll up and down with your keyboard, up and down arrows. Read through this name of this program or command is ls. It lists the directory contents. The syntax is here. And then you go through and it lists all the options. Scroll up and down. Minus A. Do not ignore the entries that start with a dot. Usually there are different formats for specifying options. Just a single dash and A, or two dashes and, an, and a word. Okay, the more verbose uh, description. Many different options there. So if you can remember the command, but not all the options, you use the man page to find those options. Scroll down, read them all. To exit this man page, press Q. Q to quit. Okay. Almost all commands that we'll use have a man page. Man, what have we used? RM. Explains the RM command and the many options that you have. Page up and page down will scroll through. So really you just need to remember the commands and then, if you want to find the options, use the man page. What if you can't remember the command name? What if you don't know CP is for copying or RM is for deleting? There's a very basic search feature, man minus K, and then some keyword. Show me all the man pages which contain in the description delete. Uh, there's a lot. You need to scroll up and down to find. It gives you the name of the command and the, and the description. It's not, not the best of search features, okay? But sometimes it will get you what you're looking for. So there are many commands that refer to delete. So it's a very primitive search for uh, a command. Really, if you want to know a command to do something, probably your best bet is to search on the internet. Okay? How to delete a file in Linux. And it will give you the command. But over time, you'll learn those commands and you'll remember them. Okay. We can move about directories. We can create files. Let's create a few, few more files. Um, Actually, I've got my file. What did I call it? Dot. Uh, file extensions don't matter in Linux or Unix. Up, to, up until now, my examples, I called files dot txt. It means nothing dot txt. With respect to the operating system, the extensions do not indicate what the file is. 
Who did that? Someone's messing with my terminal. That's all right. Uh, how do I attach? Uh, what was I saying? File extensions don't matter. The file abc is a text file. Just because it's not abc.txt doesn't change the, the contents or the format of the file. Alright, some other ways to view a file. Cat. Cat displays the contents of a file. Okay, a very quick way to display all the file. When you have a very long file, it just lists all those lines. Uh, what's a very long file? Uh, I can remember a file called services. There's a file in the etc directory called services. Have a look at it. It's just a text file. It doesn't matter about the contents. But when you type, and I'll do it again, cat, and that long file, cat displays everything on the screen, it doesn't stop. So it just scrolls through. Not very convenient in some cases. So there's another command called less. Similar to cat, displays the contents of the file, but it scrolls one page at a time. And you can use your arrow keys to go up and down. And page up, page down. So that's a nicer way to view the contents of a text file. I'll do it again. Less displays a long file page by page. Allows you to scroll to, to exit, press Q, like a man page. Cat displays the contents of a file as is. Just displays all of it at once. So we can view files. What else? Uh, you want to see the first line of a file. We can use head, or the first few lines. The head of a file. Head shows by default, I think, the first ten lines of a file. You can specify how many you want to see. Head minus one. Show me the first one line of a file. Head shows the head of a file. Cat shows the contents. Less shows the contents page by page. Head shows the, the top of the file. Using the minus operator, you can specify how many lines at the top you want to see. And to see the bottom of a file, what do we use? The tail. Tail shows the end of the file. For example, by default, the last 10 lines, but we can specify how many lines we want to see. Many things in Linux, we use text files. The configuration of the operating system, uh, and there are many programs to support the processing of text files, because it can help when we want to automate things. Uh, What? Let's find a file. This command called find allows you to search through the file system looking for particular files. The syntax is quite complex, but we'll just give some simple examples. Find, search in slash home slash student, files with name that end with txt. Here's an example. Find the first parameter is where you want to search. Where do you want to start your search? Which directory normally? I want to search in this directory. Then the next parameters, this dash name says search for files which have the name 
and I put it in double quotes to, to make sure this stays together, that is anything.txt. Any file that ends with .txt, do you find any? And it searches through the home slash student directory, all the subdirectories it goes through, even the hidden ones, and prints out the list of files that end with txt. So find it can be very powerful to find files on your operating on your file system. We could do a shortcut find in our home directory instead of having to type slash home slash student and we get the same result. So this is the shortcut for slash home slash student. If you want to search in your current directory you're in, I'll go into ITS 332. Find, if I want to search in the current directory, the shortcut for your current directory is dot, this directory. Find, Looking in this directory, the current one, and all its subdirectories, all the files with name ending with .pdf. And it looks in this directory. So dot is a shortcut for this directory. Two dots is a shortcut for the directory up. Tilde is a shortcut for your home directory, the squiggly line. Find has many other options. You don't have to search by name. You can search by size, by date. Uh, and when you search, you can do things like delete the files that it finds. Let's say you want to delete all the files which were created after some date on your, in your directory. You can use find. I will not do it. There's an option to find based upon date or time. And there's an option to, once you find them, to delete them. So it can be very powerful to to manipulate uh, your file system. Find looks for any file of any type, but our programs that we run, ls is an application. Okay, ls there's an executable file which implements ls. It's I sometimes we call it a command or an application or a, a program. Where is ls? Where is the file, the binary file for ls? Different ways to find an application. Which? Which ls? Which tells you uh, which binary file implements this command? Slash bin slash ls. So the ls program is in the slash bin directory. There are others, I think. Where is ls? It's a little bit more complicated than where is. It's searched for not just the program, but also the manual page. ls, the program is in bin. The man page, the help, is this file. You don't need to know about that, but where is will give you more information about a, a program. There are other ways to search, but that's enough for now. Uh, what have we missed? Okay, a couple more on text files. When we did our cat on slash, uh, I'm using slash etc services as just an example of a text file. We don't care about the content, why it's called this, but I just know it's a long text file. How long is it? How long is etc services? Tell me. First, how many bytes is that file? find the number of bytes in this file called services in the etc directory.
how big is this services file? Anyone have an answer? Well, a quick way to find ls minus l. Remember, ls lists files, minus l gives us the long format output, and it takes as a parameter we can list all files or list a particular file. And again, it won't display very nicely, but the output, this file is 19,281 bytes in length. How many lines? Well, there's a program called WC, word count. This services file contains 605 lines of text, 2,627 words, words are separated by spaces, and 19,281 characters. Okay, if you look in that text file, you'll see 600 lines, 2,600 words, and 19,000 characters. And of course, one character is one byte when you store that text file. So it's, the size is 19,281 bytes. WC, word count. It's useful to get information about a text file. Uh, let's look at some of this text file. Just look at the first 15 lines of this services file. Just see what's in it. It contains a lot of different words. We don't care about it. Um, sometimes we want to search through a file. Find all the lines in a text file which match some particular string. Grep is one way to do that. Grep. Look for the word echo in the file etc services. It uses regular expressions to search through a particular text file. In this case, any line that contains the word echo should be displayed. Of course, if you want to, you can try other words. Echo, I only did echo because I knew there was some lines in there that contained echo. What's missing? Excuse me. We've done directories, files, help, file searching, almost there. Any questions? Search for all, all right, there's your task. Find all PDF files on your computer. Hint, use find. Okay. Find all the PDF files, everything that ends with .pdf on your computer. See if you can find them. What about lunch? What should we do? What program do you use to find all your PDFs? Okay, find and slash. You need to say where to look for, where to look. Remember the second parameter, or the, our, our programs take parameters. So find is a program, the next things we type in are the parameters. So the first parameter is where to start the search from. 
If I want to look in my current directory, I use dot. But if I want to look in the entire file system, use slash. Because slash is, indicates the root directory. And the name ends with PDF. Okay? So find looking in the root directory and any of its subdirectories, because it also goes through subdirectories, which will be everything, any file that ends with .pdf in the name. Some you may see errors like permission denied, meaning you as the student user are not, al not allowed to look in a particular directory. Some directories are restricted. It'll go for a long time, maybe you'll find them. If you want to stop a program, what do you do? Control C. Control C kills a running program. Control C. For lunch today, so we'll go for another 30 or 40 minutes, and for lunch we're just eating in the, the canteen, but SIT will pay. Uh, it's a little bit easier. We're just going to write down what you want, uh, and then we'll order it so it's there on time. A few more shortcuts in the terminal. How do you run a command that you've re recently executed? I just did a find. Use your up and down arrows on your keyboard. If I press the up arrow, it goes to the previous command, the history of commands. Keep pressing up and you scroll through the commands. Up and down will scroll through the history of commands. Uh, what else? If you want to list all the commands, type history. So the, the terminal keeps track of the commands that you've been using. And it shows your history, all the commands you've executed. And it gives a number from, from the start. Uh, you want to execute one of, maybe you typed a real long command, you don't want to type it again. You want to execute a number, a, a command of a particular number. For example, I want to execute command number 104. Exclamation mark 104. Executes that command. Now you need to be careful, you need to know that 104 is the command you want and you get that from the history. Exclamation mark, what's the name? It's called bang. When there's a bang, there's an exclamation. So it's often called the bang character. Bang 104. There are many extensions to that to speed things up which we will not cover. Uh, Okay, what else? Questions on the commands we've done? Any problems? Everything okay? You, don't, you may not remember every command. Use the reference card. Uh, you need to practice to, to learn some of them. Uh, let's try some different things. So the I idea this morning is to introduce you to the, what I call either the Linux or the Unix command line. So running things on, in the terminal on the command line. Uh, and the idea is that you understand this command by the end of today. Anyone know what this command is? Okay, so we'll see that this is a command that produces this output. Okay. So we'll have a look and see some of these things and what, what all this uh, random set of characters is actually doing. This morning we'll just do very basics. How to move about the operating system in the afternoon if you still uh, have the energy we'll do some other things maybe a little bit more interesting. Uh, often I'll give an explanation of the history of Unix, of Linux, their relationship uh, and talk about why one would use the command line and Linux in general. But today we will not. We want to go straight into it. 
I'll give you some pointers where you can find out about that and read it about yourself. So there are plenty of seats spread about. Uh, yeah, give me a couple in the middle. I will show you how you can see what I'm doing on the screen on your screen in a moment. So it's a little bit easier to see, especially from the back. So I will not give an introduction of what is Linux, what's the history, uh, why use it, why not use Windows. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go direct into using some commands and then maybe discuss some of those issues as they come up. As always, some of the things that I'll present are on the website. So if you go to the website, which is ict.sittuact.h slash Moodle, follow the links to the workshops, and you will find links to some other resources. This Linux reference card is a PDF of the page you have in front of you. Okay? These documents are also on your desktop. I think I've put them there. If you have logged in, I should say again, the username and password to these machines is what? Student and student. Okay, Very secure. If you log in on your desktop you'll see uh, a folder called ITS332. That was the name of the lab. And you'll see local copies of some of these documents there. So you don't even have to go to the website. But the Linux reference card is just this one page sheet, which we'll look through over time. There's a few slides on why use Linux, which I usually present to the lab, but will not present today. And a couple of other slides, which we may select a few pages from just for display. And a couple of websites, which we'll use in the afternoon as more detailed examples, so know where to find these. Let's open a terminal, because the terminal is the application that gives us uh, the interface for issuing commands to our computer, and the computer sending back some output, and it's displayed on the terminal. So we have a terminal application and let me close this. How do you find it? You cannot see on my computer. Can anyone not open a terminal? I think in your desktop there's a black icon. You can open multiple. Open at least two. And just close this one. Resize it to fit how you prefer it. Okay, you can zoom in if you go to the menu and view zoom. You can zoom in if you want to make it a little bit bigger for you. So just get your desktop uh, ready. Open two terminals. You will need at least two. Uh, one will follow what I type, and the other is where you will type. Just before we get started on your desktop, you can switch workspaces. Uh, let's see. If you press Control, Alt, and left, right, up, down arrows, so Control, I'll just type, don't type this, Alt, and say up, at the same time it will move up a workspace. Left, right, and down, you can switch workspaces. See if you can do that. It's hard for me to show the exact command. Control, Alt, and your arrows move around. In that way, you can open a browser or a PDF in one workspace and your terminal in another workspace and conveniently switch between them quite quickly. Just so you can follow along a little bit easier. If you want, if this color scheme of this sort of white text on dark background is not so good, with your terminal, if you go to the menu and edit, 
profile preferences so open your terminal and go to the menu edit profile preferences you can change the color scheme okay and you can use the colors from the system theme or you can select a different color scheme whichever is your preference okay All right, so what we're going to do today is just some basic things that you can interact with your computer via the command line. And I'll do some things on the screen, and you can do them on your own computer. You can do them the same or differently and just explore some commands. Uh, but what's convenient is if you don't have to look at the, the projector, but you can look at your own monitor and see what I'm typing. So first we want to set that up. Here's my terminal that I'm going to use. Uh, we'll explain the prompt as we go, uh, but if you've got one of your terminals open, this is a special step at the startup, I want you to log into my computer. And my computer is which computer in this room? On the screen, which computer am I using? Anyone want to guess? It's not this one. Computer number 24 which is one of them at the back, okay? Don't use 24, I'm using it. I've logged into it remotely. I want you to log into it remotely. So, type this on one of your terminals. SSH is the program to log in remotely, log into another computer, and the IP address of that other computer is this 10.10.6.224, press enter, it will prompt for a username and password. Same username and password, or I think it prompts immediately for a password. It's student and log in. Everyone's logged in. Now, it may prompt you, are you sure you want to continue? Yes, you trust us. So in one of your terminals do this, and you'll see why in a moment. And then, Type the command, let's see if it works. tmux attach session minus r minus t demo 1. Once you've logged into that computer 24, type this command tmux, t m u x space attach dash session space minus R minus T and then demo one and press enter. We're just setting up so that you can see what I type. Tmux attach dash session minus R minus T demo one. Okay, good. It'll make sense once. Okay, good. Just get everyone at the same point. 24, you're on 22. Exit. Uh, exit. E X I T. E X I T. All right, now log in to secure shell to 24. 10 10 6 2 2 4. Tmux attach, attach is spelt wrong. Okay, we'll get everyone at the same spot and then we'll start. Tmux attach session. We're going to use this so you can see what I type. You'll see in one window what I type and in the other terminal window you will type your own things. That's all. Yes, okay. Almost ten ten six two two four. Good. Yep. Okay. No. Sometimes you 
install Tmux. Right, so you need LAN on here to connect. Use this one. Use this one. You, if you use this one, you'll be able, most of the commands. Uh, so what I suggest is use this one to see what I'm doing, and you can still run the commands on this one. Okay, so then you can view both. All right, I think everyone's there. Let's see what what that did. With Tmux is this program that allows us to share a terminal. You watch your terminal. Is it changing? So you're going to see what I type. That's all. Okay. And then you don't have to look at the screen. You can listen and look at your monitor. Okay. So now everyone's set up. What we'll do is you watch in one window and the other window you can type and follow along. So let's get started. <laughs> 